on July 15th, 2022, on a trip to LA to see Chef Magnus Nielsen speak at an event, I headed downtown for a dinner reservation at this place called Cato. Chef John Yao's one Michelin star spot has had no shortage of acclaim over the past few years, and the upgraded infrastructure in this new space for him and his team is, as he told me after my meal, incredibly welcome. The dining room has tons of windows, minimal light wood tones, as well as concrete gray industrial accents that give the food space to shine. Speaking of food, the menu I enjoyed at Cato was set, Taiwanese focused, and incredibly protein heavy with a combination of signature dishes that stick around as well as seasonally swapped newbies. For beverages, I spoke with a member of the wine team to request their recommendation for a glass of bubbles, followed by a white, followed by a glass of red, whenever it made sense to transition during the meal. Starting things off for me with a glass of P. Lancelot Royer's Grand Cru Brut Champagne. The classic oaked and buttery nose was absolutely there, but this had the acidity to still be bright and zingy. This right here, this is, this is a wet towel. Don't eat that. Starting things off with a selection of snacks. First up, chicken liver monaca. Not sandwiched like you would expect. It's served almost like a tart with crispy shallots on top. The ratio on this bite between the shell and the liver was great, and the additional allium facet was fatty and toasty. Next to that, an A5 Wagyu tartare served in a shell and dressed with Chinese beef salad vinaigrette. I was a big fan of this bite for all of the non-Wagyu reasons, believe it or not. The acidity was there. There was two types of texture between the shell and the vegetables and the tartare. This is an awesome bite. After that, sweet shrimp marinated in rice wine served on nori. This was structured well, seasoned great, I just found the shrimp's mouthfeel to be slimy, and as generous as it was to have two in one bite, it was an overwhelming amount of that texture for my personal palate. Nogoduro next, served with tomato, shiso, and fresh wasabi. The fist texture and density was on point, the herbaceousness was there, but not too in your face, and the wasabi giving the sharp bite to the wonderfully in-season and sweet tomatoes was only eclipsed by my love of this little serving vessel. This was a prime use of this bowl, sneakily building up garnish on the bottom, and then resting the fish on top. It seems kind of silly, but I had this quick moment of delight that I could just keep digging deeper into this bowl as I ate it. The next serving here was definitely a top 2022 dish for me. Kaluga caviar in the middle, supported by a layered presentation of corn, Dungeness crab, and chive flowers. Oftentimes the combination of flavors in a parfait-like presentation can get jumbled together, but every spoonful of this was complexly layered and incredibly tasty. Sweet hitting you twice from the corn and the crab meat, also supported by the allium sweetness and then fading into the ocean salinity with the caviar. There was textural variety, balance, fattiness. I, I really, really like this one. On the side, milk bread brushed with garlic butter, accompanied by some cultured Normandy butter. I was really happy to see more complexity than just flake salt on the top of these buns. I can see not wanting to overwhelm the palate with garlic this early in the meal, but I honestly wouldn't have complained if there was punchier garlic flavor on the bread to really make this stand out. I put in my notes that this is incredibly hard to not eat all six pieces so early in the meal, and so I went with one to wipe my caviar dish clean, which was I was instructed to do that and then another to pair with the butter itself, just to try that. This is another signature move, the sea urchin donut with shingled Iberico ham on top and brown butter emulsion. I know the texture of these types of donuts tends to have them be on the softer side, but I found this to be almost squishy, and you can see the rack lines on the bottom of the donut itself. And without any other texture to contrast that, combined with the fact that my last bite of the meal was the milk bread, I didn't really come away appreciating the uni or the ham from this bite as much as I would have hoped. White wine time, this is a 2012 Cote de Jura, slightly funky, slightly cheesy, and this would stick with me for the next two courses. Chef John shared with me that this was a family-inspired new dish to the menu, premiering literally on the day that I had my meal, so that preempts my constructive thoughts here. This is skin-on grilled and steamed sea bream with a bone broth of sorts on the bottom where the fish bones are steeped in their house-made soy sauce with ginger and aromatic herbs. This dish was screaming for acid, which was the only point that I took away from this dish because the umami structure was such a light protein combined with the stellar cook on the fish itself and the crispy textures to contrast that made this really close, but not quite balanced for me. This is a Hokkaido scallop glazed in a fish fragrant sauce and cilantro blossoms. I appreciated this dish because if you compare this to the way that other restaurants in this league serve scallops, either raw or barely cooked, this presentation was arguably overcooked, but not in a bad way. Stick with me. It ate like a barbecued piece of shellfish, if that makes sense, with a combination of dry and juicy textures. So there's multiple things going on in your palate at the same time. And the fish fragrant sauce was tangy. It had umami, again, like barbecue sauce. And then you add the cilantro flavor to add even more complexity and uniqueness. This was also a favorite and ate great with my glass of Jura. Okay, the next dish was also all time, but before I share that, this is a glass of 2018 Cote Rhone, primarily Syrah, juicy, soft, no complaints, but the main attraction to the table was this Liberty Age duck, 
crusted in spices, immaculately rendered and served on a maitake mushroom puree with stone fruit, sorrel, and mustard leaves. Everything on this plate was finished with fennel pollen. On the side, a rice sidecar with braised duck, crispy shallots, cilantro, fermented Chinese mustard, and Napa cabbage. I'm going to get to the main plate in a second, but right off the bat, when mixed up, this rice was really delicious, and it hammered home the, yeah, we're fancy, but we can still cook a banging bowl of rice. It was awesome to see this included as part of the presentation. But back to the duck plate. This was S tier in three key categories for me. Product curation, cooking technique, and flavor combining on an elite level. Each of these components tasted like the best versions of themselves, which comes when you both source seasonally, contributing to punchy juice and aroma from the plum, and treat products well through processes like aging and not over muddying with other flavors and compensatory garnishes. And on top of that, the cooking technique led to crispy duck skin, wildly tender breast meat, and toasted, not burnt spices on the outer crust. I don't think people appreciate how hard it is to do that. Lastly, the choice to go beyond the stereotypical duck and fruit combo by using fruit-friendly spices as well as herbs, almost like a salad with zippy sorrel, vegetally spicy mustard leaf, and fennel pollen. It just made it a hugely memorable dish for me. I love this one. Last up, Chef John was incredibly generous to include this supplement in my experience, A5 Wagyu Returns, this time with cordyceps mushrooms and Jimmy Nardello peppers, a potato puree, as well as a beef tendon ragu. All of this was meant to combine the classic steak and potatoes main fused with elements of beef noodle soup. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against fusion in any way, but to me, this was a super fun play on beef noodle with unnecessary bomb puree on it. It just didn't need that classic garnish. And as much as it sounds like criticism, the core dish is great enough to stand on its own. It's a compliment. First up in Sweetland, shaved ice with melon and yogurt. Yes, I'm saying shaved with a D because it's a play on a Korean bingsu or shaved ice combined with the popsicle, the Malona bar. So you've got a really light ice texture, saturatingly sweet melon and condensed milk with just the right amount of salt in it to make this bowl phenomenally tasty. Last up, a play on boba with boniato M cooked and then rehydrated to have the texture of boba balls, sweet and salty cheese mousse and brown butter shavings that melted as they hit your tongue. This slight swoop back up into a dessert with savory leanings was also a masterclass in understanding flavors. This really stuck with me as a fun and unique way to finish that breaks the status quo of a tasting menu. Both of these desserts were so satisfying for me, I think partly because it was such a stark contrast to all of the protein that made up the rest of the menu. And combining that with just the right amount of elevated execution and familiar flavors, the takeaway here is a traditional Portuguese egg tart, which I would eat the next morning. For now, it would hang on this little table-supported removable hook. Nice touch. Total here was $390.58. To me, Cato is an incredible restaurant. It knows what it wants to be, builds on what already exists by pulling in influences and contextualizing them with Chef John's background, and then elevates them to be a place that I would highly recommend you visit if you're in LA. If you are still watching after you like this video, I would love to hear if you would like to see Chef John come on the podcast. I really enjoyed chatting with him after my meal. I respect what he's building a lot, and I know we would have a fun conversation, but considering he doesn't really do podcasts, I want to gauge your folks' level of interest. So either comment below, John Pod, so I know you're stoked to see it, or something I never really do with interviews, I want to see your questions you would like to see me ask him in a comment below, and I'll do my best to work it into an interview if that ends up happening. Regardless, you should eat at Cato. Thanks as always for your attention. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.